Another strong piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter is something we call gravitational lensing. Now this has to do with uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, and this is an awesome theory. I mean, the math behind it actually gets a little bit hairy. I know in my own astrophysics studies, it's one of the hardest courses I took, but also one of the most interesting. So Einstein, there's no surprise why he was known to be so incredibly clever. He actually figured out how matter and uh, space should actually affect each other. So this is his general theory of relativity. This is one of the equations related to it. This is one of the field equations. But I'm not going to go into detail with this because some of the math with this it uses sort of some pretty complicated stuff. But um, what we can talk about, however, is yeah, what his theory said. So his theory said how uh, mass and space-time. Now this is something kind of strange. He figured out that space and time, so the three-dimensional space plus sort of one-dimensional time, are actually put together in some sort of four-dimensional construct that's called space-time. And it turns out sort of mass and space-time are related somehow. So, well, maybe not are related, let's say they affect each other. That's maybe a more accurate way to say it. So what I mean by that then is that his theory explained in mathematical terms how mass would affect space-time and vice versa, how space-time would affect mass. So he predicted, among a lot of other things, one of the things that his sort of general theory of relativity predicted was something like this. Now, this is a bit difficult to understand or to visualize because you have to imagine this four-dimensional space-time, which I don't know how to draw in 4D, um, but can you imagine they've tried to sort of draw it into this sort of, so this, this blue sort of grid here, that's supposed to be four-dimensional space-time. So if you could sort of, you know, set it down to be something, you know, in less dimensions, maybe it's in three dimensions only like this, then this is maybe what it would do. The idea is that mass would, in a sense, sort of bend space-time. And it turns out then space-time sort of tells matter how to act and matter tells space-time how to act. So they, they both sort of interact with each other. Now the consequence for this is this. Let's say we're sitting on Earth here and this is a star that we're looking at. And the light from the star, let's say it takes this path right here. And what it does, of course, is as it passes around this area, maybe right here it bends and then ends up coming towards us. Now, of course, we won't know necessarily that it bent. So we will look at this star. It'll actually appear over here. So see that when we look at it, it'll sort of, it'll seem like the star is actually right here. So we'll say there it is when really it's actually over here. So this is what we call this effect. This is gravitational lensing. And the reason we say lensing is because if you bend all this stuff, now it's a bit complicated because now this, of course, happens in three dimensions. But what it does, it actually does just like a lens would do, you know, a lens that would sort of magnify the uh, picture. And also it distorts it, so that means it makes it look like it came from over here when really it's over here. See, if this, if this thing wasn't there, this star or whatever this is supposed to mean, let's say I moved it over to the left, then we would just see the star would just appear to be a direct line of sight, you know, from the star to us. But instead, because this thing is there, it sort of distorts it. Now, a good way to visualize this is with a little video. Now, this video isn't sort of a real thing. What they've done, they've, they've tried to sort of show what it could look like. So this is a, just an animation of what a gravitational lens should do. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen some of these people sort of juggling with a, you know, a glass sphere. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Some people do that. I've uh, seen a cool video. So with a, you know, can you imagine some sort of glass sphere here? Imagine you sort of held it in your hand. Now this glass sphere, if you're sort of holding it up, imagine you could see through it. Well, that means if you looked through it, it would sort of distort all the stuff inside it, right? It would, it would sort of, uh, some things would be magnified, some things would be sort of bent out of a weird shape. And that's what a gravitational lens should do. So in theory then, if you had a gravitational lens, this is supposed to be it. So imagine you're sort of seeing a, um, a glass sphere. This is an animation to show what it could look like if you had this sort of lens that was passing in front of a picture that had galaxies in it. So, you know, as you sort of move to the right, it would sort of do this. So can you sort of, can you imagine this sort of glass sphere here and see what it's doing? It's distorting all the stuff. Maybe I'll play it one more time.
So you can see what it's doing to the light. Like from this one right here, when the light comes in, it's going to go kind of whoa, all the way in a ring and then back out again. And see? So this is really affecting the light that we see. Now that is in theory, that's what it should look like. You know, if you had a big gravitational lens, it should do this. Now this is what I think is absolutely mind-blowing. It's one of my favorite pictures in astronomy. It's this one. Now this one right here is, uh, well, it's known as Abel, um, but it turns out, look at this picture here, and there's lots of examples of pictures like this in astronomy. This is one of the first ones that came out. So this is a super cluster. What this means is this is a cluster of many, many galaxies. So here's a galaxy, here's another one, here's another one. There's lots and lots of galaxies. Each of those, you know, has billions and billions of stars. Now look carefully, though, at this picture. Can you see these rings going across here? You see there's a ring here, there's a ring there, there's rings here. So if you, without me pointing at anything, if you can look for those little rings, can you sort of imagine them? There's that, like that glass sphere. That's what's happening here. What's happening is matter, in this case, these galaxies here, is causing space-time to bend. And so we're seeing the light from maybe something behind it, you know, uh, or maybe something to the side of it, is being lensed. In other words, we're seeing some of the material being sort of look like it's stretched out over here. So over here, can you see these little things right here? There's lots of these smears, these little things right here. Again, those are those things that, like where I just pause it right here. This is like what's happening here. It's like the, the material that's sort of wanting to be right in the center is being sort of, yeah, smeared out like this. So although this was in theory, this is a real picture. This is in practice. So do you see these rings right here? So these rings, like this one here, for example, like that one. And I mean, there's lots of them. I'm just trying to sort of... Uh, draw near them without drawing over them because I don't want to ruin it for you. But you see all these rings are here. I mean, there's lots and lots of them. These rings are here. These are actually known as Einstein rings. Big surprise why they're called that. So these Einstein rings, what those tell us, turns out uh, by knowing how big they are and what size they are and some of the dimensions, they tell us about the mass uh, that is actually there. So see what's happening then. We have these rings here are telling us what the real mass is of this galaxy cluster. So it turns out from that you can sort of calculate, oh, this cluster actually has a mass of blah, 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 kilograms. You could calculate that. But, you know, here's the big thing here. But um, our estimates of the mass of the cluster, uh, you know, if we just use, you know, stars and gas, which is what we normally thought there was. See, if we just estimated by looking at the size of the cluster and looking at the stars and the gas, our estimates of the mass of the cluster using stars and gas only they fall short. In other words, we expect we expect a certain mass, but the uh, lensing tells us there is much more. This is the sort of key thing here. I just want to write this down so we get this all here. So this is sort of the, the main thing right here. So we, you know, when we look at this, we can say, oh, this is a galaxy of roughly this size. So it has probably this many stars. It probably has this much mass. And so does this one and this one and this one and whatever. Then you can add up all the masses of what you expect these to actually have. And the problem is, is that the mass that we sort of expect to get is nothing even close to what these Einstein rings tell us is actually present. In other words, this is the sort of the, the key thing right here, therefore, that's this little symbol right here, there is lots of mass there that we don't see. So we can't actually see it. 
Now, what could that mass be? Well, that's what we call it, dark matter. Because again, it's regular mass in that it attracts, but we can't see it, so we don't know much about it. So that's sort of the key thing right here. Is that this right here, there's lots of mass there that we can't see, so we call it dark matter.